The word of the Lord from 2 Peter 3, 1 through 9. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I've written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has, as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of, out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and the earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear brothers. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. In welcoming new members this morning, I failed to welcome back those who have moved away and are now away from us much of the time, and it's such a joy to see them when they come back to visit. Ron and Gail Baxter, great to see you guys here this morning, and Tim and Lori, always great to have you back as well. I was doing my math, and it looks like we've got, once again, about 28 feet of Walton men sitting on that, <laughs> sitting on that. When they stand up after a while, just, just look over there and... The math is pretty close. It's always great to have you back. As Peter begins what we call chapter 3 here in this second letter, he calls them dear friends. That's what a, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ calls them. They're not distant. They're not strangers. They are beloved people. And so he calls them dear friends twice, just within this section that Dave read for us. As he indicates, this is his second correspondence with them, and, and sometimes letters just leave themselves open-ended, opening the, not just the possibility, but the likelihood that there's going to be continued correspondence. I'll, I'll be writing you again, and now he has that opportunity. And he says that both of my letters, the one that you received some time ago, and this one that's now being read in your assembly, probably on a Lord's Day when the brothers and sisters came together, I wrote you then and I'm writing you now so that your memories will be stirred. He says, I, I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through the apostles. Sometimes our memories need to be stimulated. Sometimes our minds need to be stirred up and refreshed so that the most important things can be recalled. Not everything that can be recalled uh, is as important as, as other things. And it's helpful from time to time, even if you don't receive an, a, letter, a, a letter from an apostle, to just take some time for reflection and introspection and sift through your heart, sift through your mind, and separate the important from the unimportant, the significant from the very, very trivial. And I think we need to do that re regularly, especially in our contemporary society, because we're exposed to so much information every single day. And it can be nonstop if you want it to be nonstop, if your phone's connected, if your tablet has a Wi-Fi connection, if you have your laptop with you or your desktop computer, it can quickly take up massive portions of our mental hard drive space, precious memory storage space, and that's always finite space. And when more things are crammed in, some things are going to fall off, and maybe some of those things don't need to be erased. Maybe we need to hang on to some of those and sift out those less important trivial things. Not all information is of equal value and importance. Not nearly all of it. Not nearly all of it, all of it will prove to be valuable knowledge or useful information a week from now, much less a month 
from now or a year from now or a decade from now or as you live out the last days or the last hours of your life. Those things that may seem so pressing right now may well fade in importance. The Patriots and the Falcons will compete in Super Bowl 51 today, and that score in the game is going to matter today to a lot of people. But even among those people for whom that game is very, very important, seven days from now, it won't be nearly as important. Even for some of them who have something invested in that game, who have some skin in that game, who maybe have their favorite team competing in the Super Bowl this year. Uh, that outcome will fade from most people's minds in seven days, much less a month from now, a year from now, a decade from now. Ten years from now, who's going to remember what Lady Gaga sang at halftime? The only reason I know she's singing at halftime, I haven't seen Miss Gaga for a while, but in watching Sports Center during my workout Thursday morning or Friday morning, she was in this little piece on Sports Center. It was a press conference leading up to, to the Super Bowl, and that's how I learned that she was doing the halftime show. She mentioned in the press conference that her grandmother was a huge Pittsburgh Steelers fan. Her grandmother wasn't there, but her mom was there, and she got to meet Terry Bradshaw. Terry Bradshaw gave uh, Lady Gaga's mom uh, a football, but it, it just amused me the way the Sports Center anchor referred to her mother as Mama Gaga. And I thought it was funny, but I'm not going to need to know that for long. I'm not really going to need to remember that next week or next month or next year or 10 years from now. Use that time test in regard to some other things as well. It may help you deal with some of, some of the anxieties in our lives. That thing that has me so stressed out at this moment, that has me so anxious, uh, what difference is that going to make a week from now? a month from now, a year from now, a decade from now. And maybe that perspective, if we apply it, will periodically take some of the pressure off that we so regularly feel in, in our lives. So, Peter, you don't want us to remember everything. Not everything is nearly worth remembering, certainly not as important as other things. So what would you have us remember? He says the words of the prophets and the instructions of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Remember those things. Don't ridicule those things like some people do. The scoffers that Dave read about. He says in, in these last times there will be scoffers as there are always scoffers in every age. Uh, haters going to hate, scoffers going to scoff, skeptics going to skept. Uh, that's just what they do. They always have, they are now, they, they always will. Don't buy into that, he says. They're cynical, they're dismissive of what God says. Their attitude and mindset is, life is just physical. What you see really is all you get. That's all there is. There, is, there are no spiritual or eternal realities. It's just eating and drinking and sleeping and working and sickness, and health, and sorrow, and laughter, and pleasure, and pain, and life, and death, and that's it. That wraps, wraps it all up. And so such skeptics and scoffers question, where is this promise of his coming? You, you say Jesus is, is coming back? Okay, so where is he? When? When someone normally leaves and says, I'm coming back, after a week or a month or a year or a decade or a century or a millennium or two millennia, people start to wonder. People start to question. He said, don't, don't be like them. They're not factoring everything into the equation. Do we still believe he's coming back? Yes, we do. We do when the one who promised is God. We do when the one who said, I'm coming back, is Jesus. And Peter reminds us, to, to help you evade your skepticism, just remember that God's view and calculation of time is so very different from your own, from yours, from mine. We are slaves to time. If you've forgotten, you'll remember tomorrow morning. Uh, we are slaves to time. God is sovereign over time. It has no relevance to him. He exists beyond its parameters and its borders and its bounds. Two millennia, sounds like 2,000 years to us, passes like two days 
in the mind of God. So the promise stands. Jesus is coming is, is sure. God isn't slow. He isn't forgetful. He isn't negligent. He hasn't rethought his plan or changed his mind and, and just forgotten to tell us about a thousand years ago, reworked the plan and went to another option and just forgot to tell us that no, Jesus really isn't coming back. He's not slow. God is never, ever, ever late. There are multiple circumstances, bless you, multiple circumstances in our lives when we ask for more time. It could be with a research paper. Ask your professor, could I have a little more time? We ask the IRS, could I have a little more time? Could I get an extension? Uh, we ask our boss in regard to, to a project, could, could you give me another week? And most of the times, even the IRS will say, yeah, to take, take a little more time. But you can't keep going to that well indefinitely. Eventually, the professor, the IRS, uh, your manager, your boss is going to say, Where, where's the report? Where's your research? Where's, where's the completion of that project? Where's your tax return? We keep asking God for more time and God keeps graciously and patiently saying, okay, I'll give you some more time. Ever since Jesus ascended, God has patiently been giving us a little more time. God, is it too late? For me to believe in you, to submit to you, to obey you, to receive your, to, your, your salvation? Is it too late for me to turn from sin? Is it too late for me to confess your son Jesus? Is it too late for me to be united with him in baptism? To have my sins washed away by the power of his blood, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? And God always says, no child, it's not too late. If you've got time to ask the question, uh, it's not too late. We've been looking at examples of, of living faith, and maybe next week, I'm not sure exactly where we're going to go. I know where we're going to go two weeks from uh, today, but not, not quite settled yet on what to do as we're still in, in Hebrews. Two weeks from today, Life Group Sunday, I want to focus on Hebrews 13, and may spend a little time in Hebrews 11 next Sunday, but these people like Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and Joshua and Rahab and David and Samuel and Jephthah, Gideon, Barak, Samson, the prophets that he doesn't even name, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Elijah, Elisha, great examples of faith. And what we did last Sunday, um, celebrating Scott and Kim's 30th and using our text out of Philippians about Epaphroditus and Timothy reminds us that you, know, you don't have to be dead to be an example of living faith. Those people in Hebrews 11 have been dead for a long, long time. You don't have to be dead to be an example of living faith. That's why Paul used living Epaphroditus. That's why he used living Timothy. That's why we used living Scott and Kim Keel. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Paul writes, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Follow in my steps as I follow in the steps of Jesus. And at the beginning of this past week, as I, was, as I was thinking about this lesson, and especially this concept of, of it never being too late to let God recreate you. Don't, you know, it's never too late to, to start over, to begin again. I started thinking about examples of, of living faith and stories of people of, of living faith that I knew in, in my lifetime. And I've probably shared with you in different amounts and in different settings, uh, some stories about John Glenn Denning. And John just came to mind this, this past week, and I, I wanted to honor him and, and his example of living faith and his demonstrate, demonstration to me that it wasn't too late for John. And in God's time, everything worked out like God always knew it would. I met John during the time that I was in Gympie, Queensland, Australia, two years, two years right after I finished my undergraduate work. And I've told you a little about Gympie before, this little bitty farming town of about 13,000 people. I was thinking last Sunday when, when that's where I was when Scott and Kim came here. Uh, I was in Gympie that Sunday, and we had already met before you guys did. 
But we met every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock for Bible class and then 11 o'clock for worship. We had lunch every Sunday at noon and then we fellowship till two o'clock and then we had an afternoon service from two to three. We had a couple of families that drove 40 miles one way to get there. We had one family that drove 90 miles one way to get there. I checked it on Google Maps. It's 91 miles from here to McAllister. And the roads weren't nearly good, as, as good as the roads are from here to McAllister. A lot that Val and Graham and the kids drove over were, were dirt roads. So you don't ask people to go home and come back on Sunday evening when they come 90 miles. Uh, you stay and you eat and you spend five hours together from 10 o'clock to 3 o'clock every Sunday. And as I was teaching class, the, the doors of our little building, kind of like the tabernacle we were talking about this morning, the doors open to the east. And so the morning sun was, was still kind of low in the sky and there was a silhouette in the open doors at the back of the, the building, the front of the building. And because of the, all the light behind John, I really couldn't make him out very well. He stood there. I just kept on teaching, said, come on in and join us. He sat down, introduced myself in between Bible class and, and worship. He stayed for the worship hour, stayed for lunch, and it was really at lunch that we got to talk uh, quite a bit. Uh, John was, uh, he, he looked like he was in pretty bad shape. Uh, physically, he was one of the, the, the dirtiest uh, humans I, I have ever seen, just sort of caked uh, in, in dirt. His hair uh, was dusty. He was wearing stubbies, just little shorts and a singlet, a tank top, and flip-flops. And he started telling me about his life of late as we had lunch. He was in his 50s. I can't remember exactly how old um, John was. I just knew that he was 30 years older than I was, and that was extremely old. And I'm guessing that John may have been older than I am, uh, excuse me, younger than I am as I stand before you this, this morning. But no, he was in his 50s. And he had a lot more mileage on him than, than just those 50 years. You could tell he had, he had lived pretty hard, lived pretty rough, mostly on the beaches of Queensland. A lot of women, a lot of alcohol. He had lived a, a very worldly life. And then his world got shaken when he was diagnosed with uh, advanced melanoma from all of his years baking in, in the sun. And it just caused him to hit the road. He had a utility vehicle, a ute, and he put some of his belongings. How he had been able to save money over the years, I don't know. But he had quite a bit of money tucked away in a checking account that he could access at, at banks. As He drove pretty much around the country for five months until he got to Gympie. And he had driven over a lot of dirt tracks. The inside of his vehicle was just you know, that thick in, in road dust. Everything he had, had it all over it. And he had stopped in town and, and asked for directions to a church. Not our church, just some other church. And somebody gave him the wrong directions. And he came to uh, the Gimpy Church of Christ, the Pine Street Church of Christ in, in Gimpy that morning. And people started talking to him. He, he wanted to stay a while. He, was, he had not done any treatments, and he was really starting to get tired and weary, and he was going to need to stop for a while. Uh, I took him home with me for a couple of days. We, we did his laundry for a long time. We had these little washing machines over there, a very economy kind of washing machines that it had a little compartment with an agitator in it, uh, but then you had to lift it out and put it in a centrifuge on the, on the other side, you know, to, to spin the clothing. It was in a little different compartment. And the little spinning thing had a hose that came out of the bottom of it and went over into the utility sink, and that's how the, the water got out. It just dumped and, and went down the drain. And uh, First load of everything was pretty thick, muddy water you know, come, coming out of his clothing. And then we, we got, a little, got a little lighter just down to dingy and by three or four washes, everything was, was rinsing pretty clean. We found him a small, inexpensive apartment to, to rent. That first day at lunch, he said, you know, I've just been driving and driving and driving and reading and reading and reading. When I'm not driving, I'm reading the Bible. And I don't know how many times I've read through the Bible. But he said, I want you to understand I'm, I'm not a Christian. I haven't been baptized yet, and I know I need to be, and I know I want to be, but I just want you to know up, up front that I haven't been baptized. He would be 
in a couple of weeks. And soon after he was baptized, his condition began to worsen and he needed to go to Brisbane, about two hours to our south, large metropolitan area, good hospitals. He got some good doctors, but there was little they could do. They ended up amputating one of his arms. And I had seen him before that in, in the hospital. It had a large ward. There must have been 30 beds in that ward. And when we took a group of about four or five of us, that's all we could get in one car, we drove down to Brisbane one evening to go out to eat and go by and see John. And he had been moved into a small ward of about six or six or eight beds, not all of which had patients in them. And we walked in the room, and John was in a, in a bed over on this side, and his eyes brightened and his face broke into a smile when he saw us walk in. And I just made a, a beeline over to him, and, and I leaned down over the bed to, to give him a kiss on the cheek. And I don't, I don't know if I'd ever done that to any man other than my father at that point. I don't mind doing it now. The holy, I'm, I'm good with the holy kiss now. Uh, but, you know, at, at that age, it, it, I don't know what compelled me to not just give him a hug, but to, to bend down and, and give him a, a kiss on his very heavily stubbled cheek. And when I was still bent over, I felt like I was hitting the back, back of the head with a, a club. It wasn't a club. It was a square sheetrock about like that that was screwed over an opening in the very, very high ceiling that just decided to turn loose about that time and caught me right over the back of the head as I was leaning over his face. Caught me over the back of the head and the shoulders and uh, just about knocked me out. I staggered. I, I, they kind of guided me into a, a chair and then it was down to the ER and signing all kinds of waivers and no, I'm not gonna sue you and x-rays and you're okay, you just got a really bad headache and a really bad knot on your head so they gave me some, some pain relievers. But uh, th it was no coincidence that we went to see John the night we went to see John and no coincidence that I decided to, to give him a kiss. And John didn't live much longer. When he wasn't in the hospital, he stayed in the home of one of the brothers there in Brisbane named Tony Chivers, and Tony was so good to him. Tony was middle-aged, single, and he took such good care of John in his last days. And when John passed away, he had absolutely no fear of death. He was sure of his salvation in Jesus Christ. He was confident of the eternity that, that awaited him. And he had that gift and he had that blessing for the last weeks and last couple of months of, of his life because he came to realize that despite the way he had lived for practically all of his life, because he could still ask the question, it wasn't too late. It wasn't too late for God's grace to save him through the blood of Jesus Christ. And it was a joyful day that John was baptized into Jesus. And I thought about my father-in-law, Gerald Gray. Uh, most of you know he passed away on December the 31st. And many of you know that just short of three years ago, when he was 79, uh, we had the joy of making a quick trip back to Mississippi and hearing him confess his faith in Jesus Christ and rejoicing in his baptism into Jesus. And Gerald really struggled for a while. He thought it really might be too late, that God's love wasn't big enough, that God's grace wasn't immense enough, that there was too much water under the bridge, too many things said, too many things done, too late in the game for God to save him. And it wasn't. It's never too late. And it's never too soon. When you realize that Jesus is who he says he is, and he's the only one, and he's the only way, it's never too soon to say, I'll follow him, I'll give my life to him, I'll confess him, I'll put my faith in him, I'll turn and walk toward him, I'll be united with him, receive his forgiveness, receive his Holy Spirit, be added to his family, and walk in his steps daily. Today is always the day of salvation. Now is always the acceptable time. It's never too late. And now is always now. If you need to respond to Christ's call and let him wash away your sins, we would love to assist you that with, the, with that this morning. If you need to walk more closely with him, as our brother Wilford has uh, asked for us to, to pray for him that he will be able to do, we would love to pray with you as well. Let's stand and sing together.